Classes right. and everything. It's, we're so, so classy here. We are classy here. Nice uh, cuffs. Actual glasses. So I had all these like fancy notes printed out, and then the printer wouldn't print. So then I you scribbled furiously scribbled. I was trying to like remember all the brilliant thoughts that I had at you know 11:30 last night after feeding my daughter, yeah. and then I was kind of like, you know what? Other people got their notes. I'm gonna, I'm good. I'm right. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to today's panel discussion with partners like these, Strategies and Tools for Counterterrorism Cooperation. I am Melissa Dalton. I direct the Cooperative Defense Project here at CSIS, and it's my delight to be joined by uh, my distinguished and expert colleagues here today to unpack this, uh, this critical issue. Before we get started, I want to share with you our building safety precautions. Of course, we feel quite secure here at CSIS, but as a convener, we do have a duty to prepare in the event of an emergency. Um, in the event that there is an emergency here, I will uh, escort you safely and securely out of the building uh, in the doors directly behind you from which you came. Um, we'll either proceed down the street to the National Geogra Geographic Museum or up the street uh, to, to the cathedral to um, be in a, a safe and secure location. Um, finally, please do take a, a moment to familiarize yourself with the, the egress routes here in, in the building. It's clear from both the, the national security strategy and the national defense strategy that the U.S. emphasis going forward from a strategic and resourcing perspective is intended to be on great power competition. Counterterrorism, most notably, has, has been downgraded as a strategic priority. Uh, but as we survey the, the security landscape, it's clear that civil unrest, civil wars, fragmenting states, states are still to be a feature of our time. Moreover, uh, given the, the emphasis on other defense priorities, this arguably raises the imperative of uh, working more closely with allies and partners to attend to the counterterrorism challenges that, that are emerging across the globe. Um, and we have here arrayed uh, three top experts in the field from an academic and a policy perspective uh, to, to tackle this issue here today. Um, and in particular, uh, Dr. Stephen Tankel, who uh, has recently authored a book uh, with us and against us. How America's Partners Help and Hinder the War on Terror, which I know um, he will be sharing some of the insights from today. I think uh, Stephen actually framed it quite well um, in thinking about counterterrorism partners that they, they both help and hinder U.S. counterterrorism cooperation. Um, so today we'll be looking at various angles uh, of that challenge. Uh, we will start with, with Dr. Stephen Tankel today. Um, to kick things off, uh, Stephen is an associate professor American, at American University where he specializes in international security, focusing on terrorism and counterterrorism, political and military affairs in South Asia, the changing nature of alliances, and security cooperation. In 2014, Mr. Tankel spent uh, serving as senior advisor in the Office of Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, the Department of Defense, um, and as noted, has uh, written extensively on this topic. Stephen, um, to, to kick things off today, where, what's your assessment of how um, counterterrorism cooperation is evolving and how it has changed in the last 17 years? Sure. Um, well, first let me just say, Melissa, thank you so much for having me here today um, and for hosting this panel. And it's, it's great to be up here with Alice and with Col Colby as well. Um, so I, I would start by saying that U.S. objectives for counterterrorism cooperation have grown considerably since 9-11. Uh, and, and one of the things I try to do in the book is to, is to put those into different buckets. And, and it's helpful to, to build those out today. Um, the first sort of area I think that we've seen growth in is uh, in trying to work with partners on the ground for them to be the tip of the spear in terms of their conducting their own counterterrorism operations, which can either be enemy-centric uh, targeting, uh, you know, groups or individuals for uh, capture or kill operations, retake territory, things of that nature. But also, under that uh, bucket of, of counterterrorism operations, we should think about uh, taking on terrorist infrastructure also, right? So we've seen a growth in terms of trying to counter terrorist financing, trying to block the flows of foreign <coughs> fighters, things of that nature. 
Uh, a second uh, bucket, if you will, uh, or you know, you could put things under the umbrella of tactical cooperation. Here we're talking about issues such as access uh, for everything from uh, transit or basing or uh, U.S. forces, often to do partner capacity building, uh, to access for drone strikes. Because even though legally uh, the United States, you know, believes that it's within its rights to conduct drone strikes, from a policy perspective, we generally want permission. Um, also see uh, intelligence cooperation, coordination on detainees, things like rendition <laughs> falling under that umbrella of tactical cooperation. A third bucket is regional cooperation, everything from joining coalitions like the anti-ISIS coalition uh, to uh, providing support for diplomatic initiatives to try to bring the end to civil wars where terrorist groups are taking advantage. So think Yemen, think Syria, think Afghanistan. Uh, and then finally, uh, I would you know, point to efforts to counter violent extremism, which can be both specific, trying to counter, for example, jihadist ideology or CVE relevant issues such as trying to improve rule of law governance. Now, having laid those out, let me just make a couple of points about them. The first is that many of these areas of CT cooperation or many of the goods that we're seeking in these areas are not necessarily new. It's not like the United States has never sought uh, countries' contributions to a coalition before, or sought access for transit or overflight, uh, or even sought to promote rule of law and governance. It's that they're now happening, or these, these areas of cooperation are now being sought, are now taking place within a counterterrorism framework. Um, but our counterterrorism architecture, from a policy perspective, often exists alongside the more traditional foreign and defense mm -hmm. policy architecture within the US government, rather than being integrated with it. And so it's not uncommon for CT lines of effort to conflict with one another or to conflict with other policies um, in the foreign policy or defense space. The second point that I would make is that in many cases, the cooperation in which the United States is engaged is against uh, enemies that are external for it, but are internal for its partners. Um, or the cooperation that we're seeking is internal for those partners. This can range from we are cooperating with a country to wage war against their own citizens, to we are trying to get them to promote political reforms that would, in some cases, change the very nature of their polities. Mm -hmm. And so we have to account for traditional alliance dynamics. We also have to account for partners' threat perceptions. We tend to sort of think about this as if the terrorists are the bad guys, and so we should all be able to cooperate against them. But even though US policy documents often talk about cooperation against their shared threats, what I argue is we need to be cognizant that it's how a partner views that threat relative to other threats, and that sometimes the target of cooperation actually has utility for the partner in question. So we need to account for those areas when we're thinking about counterterrorism cooperation. And then finally, because I know that we're going to talk about a lot about security assistance and security cooperation today, uh, I would just end with a couple points in terms of where I see assistance as being useful and not useful. You've done a lot of work, uh, others on the panel have done a lot of work on the importance of knowing what we're using security assistance for. When we're using it for partner capacity building, that is going to be most useful where the United States and a partner's threat perceptions are most aligned and most in sync. Um, where it's not going to be particularly useful for a capacity building perspective or for trying to get a country to uh, conduct domestic counterterrorism operations is where we're using it for an incentive. Sadly, that instrument of statecraft is most useful to us as an incentive, I would argue, where we're trying to get tactical cooperation, access, um, you know, get people into a coalition but not necessarily contributing to a coalition. Um, and so I think we need to be very, very modest um, in some cases in terms of our expectations, in terms of how we use this. And most of all, I would argue, we need to know what to expect from our partners before we sort of begin making these outlays. Great. Thanks so much, Stephen, for that overlay. Um, and uh, apologies if it was a little warm when you walked in. We are addressing that. Hopefully, you'll be feeling the, the cooler temperatures coming uh, soon. Um, next, I would love to, to turn to, to Colby Goodman. Um, Colby directs the security assistance monitor um, at the Center for International Policy, where he leads research and analysis on US foreign security assistance around the world. 
Uh, Colby was previously the deputy director of the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs Regional Center based in Togo, Africa. Af prior to that, he worked for several society, civil society organizations as a researcher and advocate covering arms control and security assistance issues in Asia, Central America, and the Middle East. Colby, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, in your assessment, what are the major trends in U.S. counterterrorism cooperation spending and funding accounts since 9-11? Great, thank you, Melissa, <laughs> and thanks uh, to you and, and to CSIS for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be on the panel here and with, uh, to share it with Alice and Stephen. And I was just thinking the last time I was here in this room, when I was listening to President uh, Keita, I think, from Mali, mm -hmm. IBK, which is sort of interesting because election is coming up mm -hmm. like really soon, and, and perhaps we'll talk a little bit about Mali, maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Come up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, Security Assistance Monitor is a relatively new organization. We were launched in 2014 um, with seed money from Open Society Foundation. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we um, largely were created to try to unpack and understand security assistance spending, what, what Seawin was talking about. Um, in part because there was a huge growth in security assistance or security cooperation funding accounts. By some estimates, it ranges from 80 to maybe 120 uh, funding accounts. We, we don't really know. <laughs> um, and largely, this is uh, f funded by the Defense Department, and a lot of it was focused on counterterrorism aid. Um, and the reason it's important to focus on the spending is for many purposes, for all intents and purposes, sometimes security assistance spending is the strategy. And I think uh, it's the U.S. counterterrorism strategy, or it's a counter narcotic strategy. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps even more so now with the Trump administration, because we're not exactly clear where the strategy is. When 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 we see the proposed budget, this is what you know. We're doing night vision. We're doing this, and we're doing, like it. It becomes clear like where the U.S. is is focusing. So we're we spend a lot of time trying to get get information on that. Um, uh, a couple of months ago uh, in May, we worked with the Simpson Center to um, put out a report and. Uh, a fact sheet, sort of identifying the trends in counterterrorism spending as best we could. Um, and I think we found some sort of alarming trends, which Stephen uh, mentioned briefly. Uh, and, and that is just that the US government has been working on counterterrorism aid for 15 years. And we still do not have a clear definition of what counterterrorism aid is and is not. Um, now, there are some definitions, but uh, it's not a, an accepted standard definition. Um, this makes it really hard to understand the full extent of our counterterrorism aid and, what, and what, 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 what we're providing and what we're not providing for, for the goals. Um, at the moment, uh, the Defense Department is actually improving its transparency on counterterrorism aid um, through from programs like the Section 333, um, and others, uh, but at the, at the same time, unfortunately, the State Department is either level of transparency is either the same or is going down, uh, especially on funding accounts like the um, peacekeeping operations account, which is concerning. Uh, so given those little ca caveats, uh, uh, we have tried to identify some of the key trends in counterterrorism aid spending over the past few years. Um, so, I mean, I think there's some new changes with, with the Trump administration in terms of his strategy, but uh, in terms of the, the spending and the proposals that we're seeing, it's, it's still like, for 18 and 19, it's still high levels. It's slightly less than Obama's last two years, but it's still really high levels, you know? We estimate it's like 11.2 billion for FY19 total. Um, it's one of the Defense Department's main um, counterterrorism aid funding programs, section two, uh, 2282 and now 333. There's still a lot of money going through. There, um, we we actually did a little bit of analysis just for you uh, on like what's the trends in like it was called Section 1206, then it was 2282, and now it's 333. Like what are what are some of the because that's like one of the main global Defense Department funds over the years. Like what are what are some of the different trends and and I think some of the interesting things largely it's focused on tactical assistance, um, uh, but. Yeah, I think around 2010, 2013, we started to see more uh, um, uh, UASs, unarmed, um, uh, like uh, drone type type things, unarmed. Um, and then more recently, we've seen more assistance focus on logistics, command and control, and defense institution building. Um, 
let's see what else we have. And then uh, one other, a couple other trends I'd like to highlight is that uh, there are some differences between the uh, Trump administration and the Obama administration. We are seeing, uh, which is not news, uh, some cuts in the State Department counterterrorism aid, particularly um, for law enforcement, with the exception of the uh, terrorist interdiction program, um, which has been an increase. Um, and of course, there's a, been a more focus on DOD versus state. So um, thank you. Great. Thanks so much, colleague. And uh, last but certainly not least uh, is uh, Ms. Alice Hunt Friend. Alice is uh, my colleague here at CSIS, a senior fellow in the International Security Program, where she focuses on civil military relations and African security issues. Ms. Friend is also a doctoral student at American University School of International Service. From 2012 to 2014, she was the principal director for African Affairs in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, where she focused primarily on North and West African counterterrorism policy. Ms. Friend previously served at the Pentagon as a special assistant to the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, as senior advisor to the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Forces, and as country director for Pakistan. So lots of wonderful case studies to draw upon for today's discussion. Um, Alice, um, what are the implications of the growing reliance of the US military to broker and maintain these types of partnerships? Um, thank you, Melissa. I, I do say one of my rules of Washington is to follow Melissa Dalton around because you can <laughs> never go wrong. Um, and Stephen and I have tended to shadow each other, too. He puts up with me up at AU while I desperately try to finish a doctorate. Um, I am so glad Melissa brought civil relations into this conversation, not least because it's my favorite topic. Um, <laughs> But also because I think it's a really understudied element of security assistance um, and our counterterrorism partnerships. Um, and Stephen gets at it beautifully in this book because he talks about how terrorism is fundamentally a political issue, um, which I will get at in a second. Um, but first I want to point out, it sounds nitpicky, but I swear it's not. Um, when we talk about reliance on the military in a security assistance space or in a partnership space, we're actually talking about two different things. There's reliance on the Pentagon writ large. And there you're talking about the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And you're talking about um, DSCA. You're talking about OSD policy. You're talking about the Secretary, him, and someday herself. Um, you aren't necessarily talking about, initially, the combatant commands. If you're talking about the combatant commands, then you're talking about the military. And you're talking about, in particular, the operational military, the military whose job it is to fight and win America's wars, but also to manage uh, a great deal of our security assistance relationship, um, either through uh, DOD authorities themselves or to help funnel State Department original authorities like PKO, but to assist on the ground with that. Um, and so I think it's really important as analysts that we think about the differences there, because mm -hmm. I think they're pretty profound. Um, and when we talk about combatant commands, of course, you have your regional commands, like AFRICOM that I worked with most closely, um, but also Special Operations Command. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our training and assistance, of course, is going through Special Forces. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind, when you're talking about the military being in charge of security assistance, there's a level of civilian leadership at OSD that is thinking about security assistance. Um, but then there's also the the folks on the ground who are often wearing a uniform. Mm -hmm. And they grow up in a different institution than the civilians do. And so when you're thinking in a civil military relations context, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, terrorism itself, of course, is a multi-dimensional problem. <coughs> As Stephen points out, it's a fundamentally political problem. And so relying on any one tool of foreign policy to solve a multi-dimensional problem um, is inadequate for obvious reasons. Um, but because non-state terrorism in particular is fundamentally a, a political issue, it's a tactic used by insurgents to affect political dynamics and gain power. Um, that all the more is the reason why just using military tools to address those political problems is not going to work at the end of the day. You need to use diplomatic and development tools um, and resources. So CT should actually be a political effort that incorporates a range of tools, including the military. Um, and the military as an institution is not designed to address political issues. They're designed to be a coercive tool to change the calculus of political actors. Um, but even if they're training on the ground, that's going to be based on this narrow band of coercive expertise that the military has as a profession. That is their job. So it's not that the individuals wearing a uniform are incapable of thinking about politics. We know, obviously, empirically, that that's not true. But their job is to think about use of a coercive tool in a larger political context that it's someone else's job to set. 
Um, and so to lose that larger contextualization that comes from all the other departments um, on the US foreign policy side is automatically going to impoverish your security assistance and your counterterrorism efforts. Um, the sort of two other things I want to focus on, and then I'll shut up and let Melissa ask more questions. Um, is that if you narrow your counterterrorism efforts to the purely mill-to-mill -mill relationship side of the house, which is vitally important, it's not unimportant, but if that's where the bulk of your effort is going, at least two things are gonna happen. One is you're gonna encourage your partner military to apply that military tool domestically, mm -hmm. which can be really counterproductive um, and problematic for a range of reasons. Um, and it's also going to super empower that military domestically. You're going to be flowing resources to that military. You're going to be flowing know-how and expertise to that military. Our colleague Jonathan Caverly has written some interesting pieces about um, IMET and the distorting effects it can have as much as we all think IMET is a very important tool. Um, and so the military channel concentrating most of the relationship activity um, <coughs> is problematic for the partner. And it also goes both ways. If the Pentagon or the combatant command more broadly is the focal point for the bilateral relationship, then we aren't bringing to bear the expertise in development and diplomacy and economics and everything else you can think of. Um, and that ultimately is deleterious for the military effort, which by the way, the United States military has known for at least a decade, if not more, and has been shouting about. And so it's not sort of news to anybody in this room that pays attention, but it is something that for various domestic reasons, we just can't seem to get past um, and so hopefully we can brainstorm more about that in this room. And you should all read Stephen's book because he really moves the ball down the field for us. Great. Thanks so yeah. much, Alice, for, for situating this issue in the, in the broader Civil um, context. I want to, I'm sure many of you have uh, reactions to what's been stated thus far. Please weave those into your forthcoming um, remarks. I want to open up the, the conversation to um, several topics, but picking up on the Civil piece and thinking about um, some of the linked governance challenges that exist when we engage um, with our CT partners. What are the risks to U.S. counterterrorism efforts of partnering with corrupt and or predatory governments and security forces? And maybe we'll start with Colby, because I know you're doing some work and have a forthcoming report on this. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I mean, actually, Stephen's book has a lot of really yep. great examples. And, and, and I've been looking at the, the Yemen and Mali case studies in particular. Um, I mean, the, there's been a, a ton of research on this. I try, trying to identify the the risks. Rand has done some great work, mm -hmm. um, and I think there, you know, Sigar, the Special Inspector General for Afghan for Afghanistan Reconstruction, mm -hmm. um, has done. Um, and I think part of what there's probably still some. I'll talk about some of the lessons, but uh, but our risks. But I think there's still efforts to try to integrate these risks into the assessments, and I think that's where the gaps are happening. So um, one of the things that we've spent uh, quite a bit of time is just looking at how corruption impacts US counterterrorism aid and, and just broadly impacts military effectiveness. Um, and one of the things that's been sort of interesting is that there's a community of people that are working on sort of coup proofing, and there's a community of people that are working on corruption. And lots of times they're not talking to, they're not talking to it to each other, but they're essentially they're talking about the same things. Um, so, I mean, one of the biggest risks uh, uh, for anyone who's been looking at this is uh, massive military failure or, or uh, you know, a disintegration of the military in, in the face of, of uh, terrorist attacks. So we've seen this in Mali, we've seen this in Iraq, we've seen this in Afghanistan, Somalia, Nigeria, and then, you know, uh, 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 there's been other sort of risks. So uh, that's something we don't want. And, um, and corruption, um, has played a serious role in, in all of those examples that I, I just mentioned. Um, so, my notes here. Excuse me. Um, so, uh, one of the things that we, we've looked at uh, in, in Iraq in particular is Stephen Biddle, Biddle over at the George Washington University has um, identified that you know, one of the main reasons why Iraqi militaries have been less interested in, in, in receiving training is that essentially the, the, the Maliki pursued a, a policy of, of um, hiring uh, individuals that were more interested um, or, he, or essentially wanted to establish a, a militia for this sort of intra-Shiite um, struggle. 
and that was that and that is what he he hired people for that purpose and that's sort of how they saw their their role um, and then the the whole sort of like perspective of the Iraqi military was was in a sense focused on that um, and then that created re reverberating effects in terms of um, theft of mil military resources um, stealing of, of soldier salaries and benefits um, and and many other things um, broadly speaking there you know there are other corruption related aspects that have seriously impacted counterterrorism aid so I mentioned uh, coup proofing it, it's actually a relatively common trend uh, including sort of non merit based hiring and firing of military leaders allowing uh, militaries to ex exert resources from the government including military businesses um, I think one of the issues where we haven't focused a lot of attention on. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, in the risk assessments, there's a lot of focus on US, the chances of US weapons being diverted or misused or not used at all. Um, but there's less focus on how US uh, counterterrorism, counterterrorism aid may be used to fuel the problem. So in, you know, in early US efforts in Afghanistan, uh, some of the people that we supported essentially were giving us false information to support their political aims. Uh, in Yemen, uh, units that we supported um, uh, essentially decided they wanted to, those units were more important for protecting the regime. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to really be thinking about this in terms of how U.S. assistance could be fueling corruption because because that is essentially the, one of the main techniques that the terrorist groups are claiming this is why we need to exist, this is why you need to support us. So, thank you. Great, thanks. Do you want to pile on? Yeah. Uh, I just want to note that the relationship between legitimacy of the government and corruption is the important one to mine mm -hmm. here. And I also think there's, there's different types of corruption, if you will. So there's, um, there's the corruption in the government in Mali before the coup mm -hmm. um, and the events in 2012, which was um, really profound. Mm -hmm. And then there's corruption that is um, in pockets and problematic, and it's the kind of thing where you have a partner that knows that this is a legitimacy problem for them. So I think in addition to all the sort of upfront analyses and, and sort of honest assessment we should do of partnerships, what kind of corruption are we talking mm -hmm. about um, is one of the really important ones. Because as Colby points out, you know, corruption has this tendency to refract all of the assistance we send in, and it's going to bounce off into other directions. So we're, it's not, we're not going to be able to address the objectives we want to because there's no straight lines anywhere. Um, so it's really important for us to understand what those dynamics are because if we just feed into them and fund them more, um, we're just going to make the problem worse and mm -hmm. they're just going to be more terrorists. Yeah, um, I, yeah I, would, I would absolutely um, foot stump that idea that we do, I think, a very, very poor job of thinking about what the impact of our assistance is going to be on those internal dynamics yeah. and who it's going to strengthen and who it's going to weaken. Um, you know, and this idea of, uh, of moral hazard, right? That we are, we are reinforcing bad behavior. We actually make it less likely that right, militaries and security forces that are engaging in behavior that we know create or reinforce risk factors for terrorism will change because they do not have to. Um, nor do the governments have to, because they, what they are very often seeking is support for these forces. Um, you know, and beyond right, the fact that this can also taint our forces, if these, are, you know, these actors are engaged in bad behavior, it's propaganda for the enemy, it makes it harder to hold other partners accountable. The other thing that I was struck by, um, sort of listening to Colby and then Alice, go back to your points earlier, was that right, it's not just whether you're partnering with corrupt or predatory governments and security forces. More broadly, when we're focusing on sort of militaries as where we are partnering. Um, and I think Iraq proves this very well, um, but I think there are many uh, examples, unfortunately. S militaries don't fight because they have the capacity to fight. <laughs> yes, right. Right? Um, and, and so we tend to focus a lot on that capacity mm -hmm. um, rather than focusing on what are the threat perceptions of the partner nation? Um, how do they perceive those threats relative to other threats? Uh, you, you worked a lot on, on Mali, and one of the things that, that I'd heard from, from folks was that their perception was that Bamako didn't really want their military to be capable of going up into the north because they did not want to send their military up into the north where terrorists were because they had other threats up there 
Tuareg tribes, they did not want to destabilize the area, right? So for them, it wasn't even, we don't want to use the capacity, it's we don't want that capacity built. Yeah, I think you called it a live and let live yeah, perspective yeah, in your yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. bit of a, a tacit peace accord kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, with regards to the need for the up upfront assessment and mm -hmm. then monitoring and evaluation as you go, the problem definition, mm -hmm. what are outcomes, our objectives, there's a lot of uh, impulses right now directed from Congress as well as internal to the administration to try to tighten up some of those processes and actually mm -hmm. put in place a rigorous um, approach. But I think the devil is in the details, A, and B, um, given the operational nature of some of these questions, when we're talking about counterterrorism, there's often a crisis-driven mm -hmm. uh, demand signal to respond to. Um, so how we thread that needle going forward is going to be critically important. Um, can counterterrorism cooperation be totally transactional, uh, given, as uh, Alice was pointing out uh, earlier, that the nature of terrorism is, is a political challenge? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I think it's probably there are some nice scenarios where mm -hmm. there, it, it can be transactional. I mean, mm -hmm. I think in, depending on how you define transactional, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, if you define it as there is a specific need and they need they need this training or they need this equipment and this and they have a strong interest in doing it, then then we can support it and you know I think that can we can have a lot of benefit um, that way. Um, the, the obvious risk is if we're not addressing the things that Alice and Stephen have talked about and we're not thinking about it from a political aspect and, um, and looking at the sort of root causes, then, then, there, then there are serious challenges there. And maybe in some ways this rebalancing or, or um, uh, you know, focusing um, on China and Russia gives us an opportunity to sort of not put the pressure so much on like achieving some security dividends and allows us to sort of wait, do some benefit and cost on on their approaches because I think that it seems to me like the trend is really uh, a, a broader recognition within the U.S. government on, on trying to address these root causes and mm -hmm. the people that are that work on these are are trying to to, to look at these issues. Yeah. Anybody so, else want to jump on that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so having right having having tried to be really really clear that I. Um, and, I, and I appreciate your, your noting it, right? The terrorism, we were taught terrorism is political violence. So the idea that yeah. counterterrorism is gonna be purely mechanistic rather than, pol than, a, than a fundamentally political activity is absurd, right? Um, so much of what we are looking for is political. Almost all of what we are looking for has, right? It, there's gonna be political connotations in one form or another. Now, all that being said, do, do I think that CT can be totally transactional? Yeah, sometimes I think it can be. Uh, I think sometimes it is, and I think our problem is not necessarily that we should always be pursuing counterterrorism that is purely holistic and not transactional, or that we should always be pursuing it that it's transactional, but that we're not clear about what it is that we're pursuing and what it is that we're prepared to accept. Yeah. I think there are some cases where the political dynamics are going to be so hard to overcome that whether or not we were committed in the CVE space, it's just not going to make a difference, right? If you don't have a partner, you don't have a partner. If the assets are too big, the assets are too big. Uh, I think that goes for, right, for across the board in terms of getting at risk factors. I think that our instruments of statecraft are limited in terms of being able to convince somebody to go wage a uh, counterterrorism campaign against a subset of their population if they don't consider that subset of their population to be a major threat, right? We're not going to overcome those, the, that calculus. And so in those instances, yeah, I think you can have a transactional relationship where you're saying, look, the threat is sufficient, significant enough to us that we are going to give you X, and in, and in return, we want access to your airspace because we are going to use, uh, you know, uh, airstrikes um, and maybe the occasional counterterrorism raid to keep the threat at bay. But I think we should be very, very clear that what we are doing is keeping the threat at bay. We are not going to solve the problem doing that. Um, and I think that then demands that we be very, very clear about what we can expect from our partners and what it is that we expect from our counterterrorism policies. But it also demands that I think we, we be more rigorous in terms of our own threat assessments. Because the threat better be pretty, pretty damn high if your approach to this is, I just want to keep it at bay as opposed to trying to get at these other issues.
Melissa and I were talking about this actually uh, over lunch of the great racial tea countries mm -hmm. in the audience. Um, and I was saying at lunch that there's, there are sort of many um, contexts for security assistance where I do think that we, we in the United States should be a little bit more comfortable with transactionalism mm -hmm. because that is sometimes the most practical and practicable approach. Counterterrorism, however, I think we need to think about a little differently, in part because there's offensive counterterrorism, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. a lot of what you just right. talked about, Stephen. But then there's the defensive aspect of it, which is an intelligence and policing yes. mission. And boy, you better have a lot of open communications and ongoing trust with partners around the world for that. That's not a, I'll do this if you do that, quid pro quo type of relationship. That's a, mm -hmm. I'm seeing chatter on these uh, you know, it, it, within these mm -hmm. groups or these channels that I've been watching, and I'm going to proactively pass that to you because right. we're simpatico. Um, I don't know if that works as well. I mean, I think there can be transactionalism mm -hmm. in the intel sharing world, but I think it to sort of really cover the waterfront on a defensive counterterrorism posture, you need a much more strategic relationship with that partner. Um, so that was sort of like since lunch, frankly, I've been sort of cogitating on that about like, well, could you really sort of buy and trade and sell on that level of cooperation? I don't know. Um, I mean, I think it would, it would probably depend on the intel relationship and yeah. it would depend on the threat. Uh, you know, I can think of countries where our relationships are pretty much transactional mm -hmm. um, and the intel is not, right, is it, the, the intel to intel relationship is sufficient to avoid a major attack. Mm -hmm. It is insufficient to get it right at, at yeah, to, do to, defeat, right, to do that yeah. more proactive piece to defeat the group. And yeah. so that's where I come back to um, being clear about what it is that we're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. right? And then in some cases, not that I think that we should, that we, we should ever want to be satisfied with that I'm keeping the threat at bay uh, and the intel that I'm getting or that you're acting on is kind of bare minimum to avoid an attack against us because that would be really, really bad for you mm -hmm. because of the consequences. But in some cases, that may be all we can expect. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to differentiate that from other relationships. But I think the other point is we need to know where we, we need to do a better job of leveraging relationships with countries where it's not transactional to compensate. So Yemen, I think, was pretty transactional by the time the Saleh you know, regime collapsed. Our relationship with Saudi Arabia was not transactional, and the Saudis were doing a lot on the intel space to help us in Yemen, right? So we were able to compensate there. Mm -hmm. um, I think of some of the things that Five Eyes does with some of the countries in South Asia and things like that. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And to be clear, Stephen, you're talking about the AQAP cooperation. I'm talking about the AQAP. Saudi, right, not the Houthi. Not, not the Houthi. Yeah, no, no. Right. I'm talking about under, before Ali Abdullah Saleh leaves, right. what the Saudis were doing with us uh, to sort of to, to manage the AQAP problem in Yemen because the Yemenis were unreliable. Correct. Thanks, thanks for I that clarification. Of course, please. That, yeah. I mean, I, I, I totally agree, Alice, and, and I guess in some ways I was just thinking theoretically, yeah, we could do it if like, the partner had all the, the right interests, but I think that the, the danger is that so often we'll think about it just from the transactional, but there's a lot of evidence where we just think about things from a transactional and we give some support, we increase capability, and they use it in a way that, mm -hmm. that fuels terrorism. You know, Kenya police, I think there's a, been a lot of concerns about how um, the, the assistance that we gave to them and how they reacted to some of the m Muslim community near Somalia, and there's probably other other examples. So if we're not if we're if we're not thinking about the broader context mm -hmm. and we're just thinking, okay, we're, they need this capability, and we're going to give it, then then yeah, and yeah. that and that there's the real risk yeah. there. Right. Well, and I think you know points all well taken, and then there's sort of this meta question attached from a policy perspective because inevitably we we want to be pursuing or deepening our relationships to a strategic mm -hmm. end, and right. if you find yourself in this inertia pattern of transaction after transaction, to what end? Um, so I think we still have to to confront that. Um, given the array of experience, I, I have to ask this question. Um, and in, in your years of, of studying and practicing on this issue, what are the top three lessons of building partner capacity for counterterrorism from the last 17 years? Do you, uh, let me, which one of us do you want to go first? You, you go. Whoever wants to. <laughs> yeah, you wrote the book now. Oh, um, <laughs> all right, fine. Um, I mean, I think the, 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 the first is, and I've, I've said this before, but um, you know, in passing, know what to expect 
from, from the recipient. Um, you know, I, I write in the book towards the end that when you, at least from a counterterrorism perspective, we have, and it's a clunky phrase, but an overly threat-centric paradigm. And by that I mean the United States looks at the threat and it assesses, right, where that threat falls, you know, on the spectrum, and, it, and, and then it responds accordingly and it expect its, expects its partners to respond accordingly on the basis of that threat, right? It's here's what we need, here's what we want. Mm -hmm. And to the degree that there are questions of you know, people in the intelligence community, at least from you know, many of the analysts that I've spoken to, uh, if, if there are questions regarding the partner, it's what's the partner's absorption capacity, right? How much stuff can we give them to help them do the things we want them to do vis-a-vis -vis the threat? Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that we need to augment that with a partner-centric paradigm, um, right? And I, that has a rubric that kind of goes through a lot of the things that Alice and Colby have been talking about on this panel and writing about and that you've written about and talked about in terms of how that assistance is going to be used and what impact it's going to have on different players within the country and all of that. Um, and what it is, we, right, how the Kenyans are going to use that. I don't think that, I don't think the capacity building can be transactional. Right? I think that mm -hmm. access can be transactional. I think that in some cases even intel can be transactional. I don't think capacity building can be transactional. I think that mm -hmm. you, you have to get into threat perceptions and are we linked up and all of those issues. So the, the first, the topmost is sort of, you know, we talk about know your enemies as well as you know yourselves. Well, you also have to know your partners. Uh, the second is, is that it is much easier to build capacity than it is to build will. Um, and we are overly focused on the sort of the technical means of this. And I think that's in part because of the people that we are relying on to do it. And that is not to take anything. I think, I think Alice's points, right, about um, the, the, the military being operational on the ground, you, you expect those people to be focused on the operational piece of this. You don't expect them to be focused on the diplomatic piece of this. Um, you know, I, I talked about the importance of strategic empathy on another panel, and it was Corey Shockey, uh, for those of you who don't know, is the deputy director of IISS, and she was the host. And she asked me to explain strategic empathy, and I explained it, and she looked at me and she goes, Stephen, I think you mean diplomacy. <laughs> right? Um, but that's really, you know, that's a lost think, art. Yeah. Right. That's, that, that I think that gets lost in this. And then the final one, um, right, which is like it's easy to tee off on this with this panel here, is the importance of, of assessment, monitoring, and evaluation is that um, if you, especially when you're building a capacity that's going to take a long time to build, or you're trying to get to a longer term, not necessarily immediate transactional result, mm -hmm. if you don't have a theory of change and you don't have a map for how to get there and you don't have metrics that you can assess along the way to know whether you're succeeding or failing and where you need to revector. You know, I think we know by this point that if you just kind of like blindly push forward, you can be blindly pushing forward, right? Building a, a, a CT force in you know Mali, for example, for almost ten years, and then you're like sort of shocked when it collapses during a, a conflict. So, mm -hmm. yeah, great. That's good. Um, I think I'm going to echo a lot of what you said, um, and also what's been in recent NDAAs, mm -hmm. um, but it's good and we should all make it actually happen. So honest assessment of where interests overlap yep. up front, absolutely, um, and how perishable that is. Yeah. So I think we do, especially in the posture world, we like mm -hmm. worry a little bit about like if the relationship goes south because there's regime change over there. Mm -hmm. We don't think a lot about regime change over here um, and about how much they can <laughs> rely on us, right? Yep. So I think that's that's worth also mm -hmm. also being honest about, right? How much, don't overpromise. Um, Underpromise, over deliver. Um, uh, number two is build institutions, not units, right? This is like a truism, yeah. it's almost boring to say it, I'm sorry, but it's so true. Um, we, I did build capacity, not will, so you're fine. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have spent lots and lots of years building elite mm -hmm. counterterrorism units that um, in some places get to get used to great effect in some places sort of scatter to the winds later, depending on, again, the partner and kind of what their interests are and what to do with these personnel and these capacities. Um, but sort of universally, the problem is that then you have these super elite units that feel super elite, and then they're in this institution that's hollow and doesn't mm -hmm. know how to take care of them. It doesn't know how to grow their career and doesn't know how to pay them on time. I mean, basic stuff. So. And this is a lesson learned over and over again in the Africa context, certainly. So build institutions, not units. Again, NDAA picked that up. Mm -hmm. um, and then track who's trained. Know who you trained and where yeah. they went. Um, because then it's Groundhog Day, because it's sort of like constantly, this is part of the institution mm -hmm. piece. If you build good institutions that can do personnel tracking, which is super boring, but really important, 
Um, then you will know, yep. you know, have we trained 3,000 people really, or have we trained 1,000 people three times? Um, and again, I think we're getting better at this over time. Mm -hmm. So my, my personal experience in government is getting a little bit stale, but, um, but it's still something that I think we have to work on, especially in countries that don't do sort of this level of tracking yep. as much as we do. Um, right. Anyway, Colby, I'm That's sure, cool. is going to have even yeah. better ones. I mean, it's tough to go after you guys because I have some of the same ones. But, um, you know, Stephen, when I was reading your book uh, or parts of it, I was thinking of one of the Sun Tzu's quotes, which gets used a lot, but I think it's useful here. Um, know the enemy and know yourself. In a hundred battles, you will never peril. Uh, if ignorant of both your enemy and of yourself, you are certain in every battle to be in peril. And, of course, that they're just talking about the enemy and yourself, but but I think it should... it likely applies in, in our sense to our partners, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, and I think we've, we've done a pretty good job of understanding our enemy, in these case terrorist mm -hmm. groups, but, but then connecting um, their relationship within the, within the state and then how they might be connected to, to, other, <clears throat> to other government competing interests and, and in some cases the military mm -hmm. and, and um, is, is, is less so. Um, I mean, of course, because we're sort of focused on corruption a lot, I think there's some, there's some serious gaps in our, in our mm -hmm. understanding about um, uh, both from like the, the, how the government uh, in corruption impacts the military and then, and then within the military itself. Um, we've, you know, been trying to identify some of those like common corruption themes, hiring and promotion, theft of salaries, procurement issues. Um, military businesses and try to il illustrate you know these and identify countries where um, maybe more risk um, I think one of the things we Alice, Alice you talked about is is um, uh, uh, sort of like uh, uh, the US focus on um, creating counterterrorism units or supporting um, uh, special forces and oftentimes you know one of the common themes of Coup proofing is to create these these side forces or create another yeah. like a presidential guard or, or you know to like support them from the from military's mm -hmm. attacks right so when we're coming in we have to think about that relationship we have to think about divisions within the military and in, in Mali there was there was serious divisions mm -hmm. in the military and that contributed to a lack of resources in one group and, and an over resource in other groups and then of course you know contributed to the coup in Burkina Faso obviously even after a new president and leadership comes in they're the, the ones that were, tried to do the coup and then are out you know they're like causing some problems right now so um, and you know in Mali now like the unless you a new leader comes in and you start to reform these systems then the, all these same dynamics are going to continue um, so anyway, that's a lot just on improved risk assessments. <laughs> uh, but the other thing I'd just like to add is that we need to know ourselves better too. So we've talked about um, under understanding what our goals are, but I think yeah, having the, you know, what of a large part of what we're trying to do is having the public and policy community help the US government do these risk assessments um, and having more transparency. Um, we're, you know, in some ways we're moving in the right direction, but um, there's still a lot that needs to be made. We still, in many cases, don't know the type of aid that we're providing, um, and uh, you know the type of equipment, and those things could really help for doing these mm -hmm. these sort of risk assessments. Great. Can I just add? Of course. Like yeah. the the key node here is always the embassy on the ground. Mm -hmm. I worked yeah. on two different regions when I was in DOD, and unfailingly, when I got to get out and talk to embassy personnel, they taught me a ton, and they knew way mm -hmm. more than anybody else about those exact dynamics yeah. that we're saying we need yep. to know about. Um, so this is what an embassy is for, you know, it's to really get it, to really know, yeah, you right. know, like, well, you know, the presidential guard is really like running roughshod over these guys, and there's like real discontent. They're going to know. They're going to have that on the ground, Spidey sense, and that's just so so vital. So I just want to put yeah. that plug out there. Yeah, and arguably yeah. there needs to be that demand signal from Washington yes. to, yeah. to yeah. collect and, and harvest reading that, the cables. reading yeah. the cables, <laughs> and you know doing more green forest analysis, mm -hmm. as uh, our colleague Tommy Ross has recently written about. Mm -hmm. um, so given these lessons, um, how do we make the most out of cooperation despite the risks and pitfalls that we've been discussing today? And when and how can building conditions and or incentives into cooperation work? Stephen, did you want to start? 
Um, sure. So I, you know, I'll just I'll, I'll reinforce one of the things that I said previously, which is, uh, and, and and Colby mentioned that Sunso reference as well, is that yeah. know our know our friends as well as we know our enemies, right? Um, spend spend more time on you know looking at green rather than than just yeah. looking at at, at red. Um, that's number one. Number two. Uh, I do believe that we need to kind of expand the toolkit of engagement that we have right now. Um, and I think that we're beginning to see this with the NDAA. I think we're beginning to see some, some movement. Uh, Counterterrorism cooperation looks different now than it did you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and some of the tools are simply outmoded. Uh, you and I have written together on the need for positive conditionality, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you've got a whole report on sort of where conditionality works and where it doesn't work. Uh, you know, I, there's too many examples to point to where we've tried to use negative conditionality only to see it fail. Um, and I think ex experimenting with different ways for positive conditionality um, not only helps to, to sort of bring difficult partners along, mm -hmm. um, but it also gets at that, somebody mentioned the abandonment issue um, right earlier, is it can potentially uh, reinforce the sense that we're, you know, we are, we are truly partnering with you rather than hectoring to you, and we are potentially going to be there for the longer term. Um, I think it's weird to talk about coercion when you talk about partners until you realize that like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia are counterterrorism partners, right, and, and, and you know, Yemen before the government collapsed. Uh, and coercion of one form or another is sometimes necessary. Not necessarily military coercion, although that's how we got Yemen and Pakistan to cooperate after 9-11. Um, but right now, there's this, I think, just too big, big of a gap in between kind of like wagging our finger at somebody on the one hand or threatening to label them a state sponsor of terrorism on the other hand. Um, and that doesn't really capture the degree, the, the ways in which partners can help or hinder, and it also doesn't account for the fact that we want to be able to put pressure on our partners while still maintaining cooperation with them. Uh, and so uh, in the book, I, I lay out different ways in which we could uh, create new coercive instruments that could be used um, you know, while still maintaining cooperation. And then the final thing that I would just note, uh, and this is either, I guess, like the best or the worst time to be saying this, uh, I was just over in Europe uh, for a couple of weeks talking with our allies there about how we could leverage one another more closely in places like the Middle East and Africa. Um, and I say, right, it's potentially the worst time because of the state of transatlantic relations, and it's potentially the most opportune time because counterterrorism cooperation is still one area that's working reasonably well to hear all sides tell it. Uh, we are uh, not prioritizing counterterrorism as much as we used to, which means that we will need to rely more on our allies. Um, and I also think, you know, and I don't agree with all the ways in which the Europeans work, look at this problem, and I have plenty of disagreements with them, and they have plenty of disagreements among themselves, but, um, but I think they do have a better picture of the degree to which this is not just a terrorism issue, but a fragile states issue. I think mm -hmm. uh, you're a senior advisor on the, on the fragile states, Red Hat Account yeah. of Violent Extremist yeah. Organizations yeah, in fragile states, which USIP is doing. And I think that is a prism through which we need to be looking at this more and more, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We tend to think, hey, we got to stabilize this country because there's a terrorism problem. And they think terrorism is one of the symptoms of instability. And we're dealing with a lot of those issues related mm -hmm. to instability. And so they come at it from a different, and I think, a vantage point that could be more helpful to us and we could be more helpful to them if we were more synced up. So that, that's something else I think that we need to think about more. That doesn't mean burden sharing, we do less, you do more. It means how do we leverage one another to a better degree earlier on at the strategic level. Great. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I do think also um, we're at this point where because we're trying to focus more on state-based challenges mm -hmm. and um, de-emphasize, although not dismiss, but de-emphasize counterterrorism as sort of a central mm -hmm. DOD approach, um, we are in this space where we're sort of rethinking how can we do, how can we counter violent extremism um, and prevent terrorism in non-military ways. Um, and I've been thinking about that a lot recently because we have a, a woman working with us um, this summer named Jamie Wise who's working really hard on the idea of transitional justice issues and looking at it, fragile state sort of pre-crisis and then post-crisis and how transitional justice can address these really deep social divides that often end up 
manifesting themselves as terrorism, but sort of in a European Union sort of perspective mm -hmm. as this is just one um, symptom of a deeper disease and that there's actually another problem going on. Terrorism isn't itself the problem, it's just a problem for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm like really fascinated by this research and the sort mm -hmm. of perspective that as coming out of OSD, I haven't thought of as much. Um, but I think as we sort of explore what other tools we have in our toolkit, um, this, is a, this is a time when we can really think much more expansively about what it means to prevent people from using terrorism as a tactic mm -hmm. in their political struggles. Mm -hmm. Great. Colby, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I've been struggling to figure out like how we pursue a pos uh, policies and approaches that I think are more holistic and actually government wide support, however you define that. Um, in the, in the current context, with with with, with State Department struggling and, and continue to re lose resources, and Defense Department, of course, you know, having more resources, and all the reasons, Alice, that you outlined, you know, from <coughs> for the Defense Department's approach. I mean, one interesting thing is that uh, so far the Trump administration's budget for CBE or sort of like anti-radicalizations has been pretty good, which was surprising. To me, mm -hmm. um, there is some efforts within DoD to sort of address stabilization, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. It's I, I need to look into that more, but it seems like that might be an angle, and I and I wonder how how do we, and maybe this is just my misunderstanding, but it does it does seem that you know at the White House level there needs to be some uh, efforts to to get them to get to support sort of like a root causes because that doesn't seem to be something that they're particularly interested in. How do we, how do we push that support? Um, so, I mean, I think uh, it's obviously really important to, to have these sort of risk assessments that we've talked about. But then once you do that, people that are, need to make the decision need to have, like, be incentivized to, 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 t to, to not take the risks. Because I feel like there's so much pressure on the combatant commands or people at the De Defense Security Cooperation Agency to, or whomever to like do it and spend the money, and there and there's yeah. no there's no ramifications for for not doing that or for mm -hmm. failing, um, and perhaps that incentivizes less less evaluations as well. But I don't, uh, Congress, I think, has a super important role to to be mm -hmm. changing those structures and incentives, um, which of course they're they're trying to do more. Um, I, I fully support that the U.S. needs to be engaged more politically um, on on the sort of broader government issues and where where um, terrorist groups are recruiting based on corruption. I think the U.S. needs to be out front saying where where corruption is bad. <laughs> like this hot grand corruption is seriously affecting gov governance and rule of law, and it's an issue. And we're we're trying to work with you, and and I think perception matters. Mm -hmm. If if it's if people that are being affected by corruption are seeing that the U.S. is helping and the government is taking some legitimate action, that matters. That can have an impact on recruitment. Um, yeah. Great. Just a note: um, yeah. Colby mentioned the the DoD efforts to um, address stabilization mm -hmm. or an updated stabilization policy. Yeah. So the administration just released a stabilization assistance review framework that said joint collaborative document between the Department of State, Department of Defense, and um, USAID. Um, and actually there's a key criteria and set of recommendations in there um, related to conducting conflict aware or conflict sensitive security yeah. sector assistance mm -hmm. that I know um, is one of the key lines of effort that all three of those uh, departments and agencies want to follow up on. Um, but again, uh, the devil in the details mm -hmm. in terms of how to, to operationalize that um, going forward. I have one more question for our panel and then um, want to open up uh, to, to you all for question um, and answers from, from the audience and engagement with our panelists here today. We've been, mostly been talking about state based partnerships. Um, however, the United States uh, has been known uh, to embark upon partnerships with non-state actors uh, beyond the, the obvious and fundamental difference between state-based and non-state based partnerships. Um, what are the best practices for, for counterterrorism in engaging with a non-state based partnership? I'll let someone else take that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Can I answer it like not directly? Sure. <laughs> I mean, I think my biggest concerns are like militias, right? So yep. it's mm -hmm. officially state-based, but um, obviously we've had these problems in Afghanistan and right now in Iraq, of course, there's the Shiite militias and there's the um, Maqdaders militia and uh, you know, I, the U.S. is struggling to try to figure out how to do this, but but I, but there are so many. The, the U.S. has faced so many risks in using that. In Iraq, of course, the ins, you know, I mean, the, 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 there was an article recently in the Washington Post. It was highlighting how um, one of this militia basically just controls one city in Iraq, and there are Iraqi security forces there, but they're they're sort of like underneath the militia. So really, the militia is controlling it, and uh, obviously that presents a lot of problems when, when the militia decides their interests are divergent from the security forces. Um, so, anyway, yeah. Right. I think a lot, I don't think this is what your question is getting at, but I think a lot about how critical um, a proactive NGO presence is. Mm -hmm. um, when I was PD Africa, we had particularly crisis group, but a lot of different NGOs come in um, just to sort of explain uh, explain to us kind of where our priorities were all screwed up um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and say, you know, you're not paying attention to this big story or you're not um, sort of giving enough emphasis in this area. Um, and those were always incredibly useful conversations because, again, their focus and their profession was a totally different thing than what I was supposed to do mm -hmm. with my time. And so I got this incredible um, dump of insight from somebody without having to go read 9,000 <laughs> reports. Um, and I, I just think that the perspective that folks who live and work on the ground in a humanitarian or a political mm -hmm. capacity mm -hmm. who aren't USG are going to be able to have, um, I think, a different relationship with folks on the ground. And also, mm -hmm. they're, going to, they're going to have, um, they're just going to have different perspective. And they're going to have, they're going to be at liberty to consider different ideas um, than folks that are, that are USG bound. Um, and that's just really, really useful. And so, again, I think as we're thinking about CT in this broader political context, we should absolutely keep those relationships fresh. There's a big sensitivity in the community to being seen as sort of an intel source of the US government. So you have to be really, really careful about that. Um, but I, when I was in, in government, my door was always open to NGOs who wanted to come make me smarter, um, because they always did. Great point. Yeah, Thanks. I mean, I would I would just pick up on both of those pieces by saying it, it also, because Colby and Alice were talking about two different types of non-state actors, yep. I think we really need to be clear about what it is that we're trying to, right? Yep. Which, which bucket are we putting this in and what are we trying to accomplish? Um, if you look at CVE, a lot of the best practices, right, the, in the, and it's still nascent literature because CVE mm -hmm. is still a relatively nascent field, talks about the fact that you really can't do good countering violent extremism programming without having civil society um, engaged. Uh, and so, you know, I think there, um, you, you know, to, to the degree that, that U.S. And, you know, that, that, that U.S. and civil society, uh, you know, organizations on the ground are, are, are broadly aligned in terms of objectives, yeah. um, you know, this is a place where uh, a little bit of capacity building could potentially go a long way, but perhaps more importantly, I think one of the challenges that, that comes up here is a lot of our partners are actively clamping down on those same civil society organizations. And they're using terrorism as an excuse to do so, mm -hmm. um, right? So they are labeling civil society organizations that are, um, right, a, seen as a potential political challenge to them as a terrorist organization. And these are the same organizations that we or other states should ideally be partnering with and that, quite frankly, our partner government should be partnering with mm -hmm. for CVE purposes. Um, and so I, I want to sort of highlight that as, I think, a challenge, but also that these are organizations where where to the degree possible we should really be looking to go to the map for them. And I think this entails us sometimes asking ourselves with some of our partners, how accommodating of, of a partner government do we need to be mm -hmm. um, when it comes to its treatment of civil society organizations, right? And I think we sometimes let ourselves be taken for a ride in that if you pressure us too much, then we're not going to be doing these CT operations anymore that are more mm -hmm. short term. And I think where that partner clearly views the group in question as a belligerent, the answer can be, no, I, I call your bluff. Yeah. I think you're going to do it, um, right? 
uh, Intel and everything else, that then gets much more complicated. Um, when it's dealing with militias and things like that, obviously things become much more fraught. Um, I think it's OK for those relationships to be ephemeral. I think this is a space where we, you know, and, I, and I'm still kind of working through this. So this is a very, very, you know, not fully baked assessment. But I wonder if this is an area where, um, provided we have mapped the human terrain, we can be more comfortable leaning into that transactional space. But again, provided we have mapped the human terrain. Because to Colby's point, we clearly hadn't mapped the human terrain in Afghanistan. And every warlord you know, or uh, you know, person with a grudge is turning in the guy next door as Al Qaeda. Right. Yeah, I mean, Libya today right. is a great exactly. example yeah. of you know, the moral hazard you yeah. raised earlier. Um, so yeah, I, I tend to be really skeptical about our, especially in a place where we have no yeah. embassy presence, right. <laughs> because it's too dangerous. Right. Um, yeah. I'm really skeptical, uh, skeptical about our ability to predict what a militia is going mm -hmm. to do if it becomes politically empowered, because it wins a bunch of fights because right. we help them. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, governance is all about choosing and trade-offs, and so yeah. sometimes that trade space is real and yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No good answers. And, no good and answers. Doubly complicated. If it was easy, it would be done yeah. by now. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a two finger on what Steven said. It reminded me. I mean, I think maybe like part of this assessment, if we're providing uh, support to foreign security forces to address a terrorist threat in a certain community, I'm thinking about a little bit about Burkina Faso now. Maybe we should like take send somebody to talk to the community and figure out their relationship with the security forces and what they need and then have that feed into our overall analysis. It seems like that. Well, and this is that, what N yeah. NGOs and right. this is how they can help, folks but, do anyway, yeah. right? So it's right, just like yeah. pay attention to that. But, but you still need Often that knowledge is out there. Right. But yeah, totally. Right. Right, and I the mapping of right, right, the, right, the, guess, the human yeah. terrain, to, to Stephen's point, you know, I think as proven out in, in northern Syria also involves understanding the, the political calculations of the, the non-state actor partner as well as the regional terrain and, and how our regional allies and partners might uh, react to the investment in that partnership. Well, thanks so much. Um, at this point in the conversation, I'd love to open it up to audience Q&A. Um, we do have CSI staff on hand with microphones, um, so if I call on you, please wait for the staff member to uh, provide you with a microphone and state your name and affiliation and uh, ask your question in the form of a question, please. <laughs> All right, we'll start with the gentleman in the first row here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. First, let me thank the panel for an absolutely fascinating discussion, one that could occupy us for several days rather, rather than the next half hour, maybe. My name is Dennis Dutre, and I am supposedly a non-resident fellow at CSIS, although I don't have a piece of paper that tells me that. But I'm told that that's true, so. <laughs> um, I spent uh, some time in Iraq and Afghanistan, both with Petraeus and McMaster, um, most of my time actually in Iraq. And I have a question, although I have thousands of comments, which I will not bore you with. Because, by the way, I have a book coming out. <laughs> in about a month with Prager Macmillan. Keep an eye on it. Um, but the, the theme, that, the two themes that, that sort of transcend many of these comments, one is the political nature of terrorism and counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, <laughs> and the other is the need for capacity building. And just two questions on that. On um, the political nature, I would go even further than Stephen goes and says, say, that our policies in both Iraq, Afghanistan, and by the way in Vietnam, were almost diametrically opposed to a political solution. I used to say in Afghanistan that the United States spent 10 years convincing the Afghan people that their government couldn't tie their own shoelaces. They had to do everything for them. They had the troops, the money, the advisors. I mean, nobody went to the government, especially in Kabul, which was a total mess, okay? So we undermined the fundamental link of a counterinsurgency policy, which is a relationship between people and the government. So point number one is, do you agree with that or is that overboard? Point number two on capacity building. I've spent 23 years at the World Bank trying hard in many fragile states to build capacity. And hey, confession, I failed. Why? Because you can't build capacity unless you give responsibility, okay? And what does that mean? Let's go one step further. That means you have to give 
units the right to fail. Mm -hmm. And politically, we can't do that. That's why we end up being responsible, and then there's no capacity building because our counterparts say, hey, they'll do it for us, so why not? So is that, I, yes, those are statements, but I put them in the form of questions because I'm curious to get your reaction to them because you know much more than I know, so thank you. Thank you. Anybody want to start with that? Oh, um, sh sure. oh, I thought you had to start. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I can start. Wait. Sure. We're <laughs> Colby, go uh, for it. Everybody's uh, so polite. I know. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I think there are examples. Uh, I mean, I think Afghanistan uh, illustrates the, the, the challenges of, of sort of our approach and, and some of the things that we did, did under, I think did help undermine the relationship between the state and people. I mean, I would say there's a, there's a deeper issue when we first did the political settlement. We, we sort of took, you know, decided, okay, these, these individuals that have a past criminal of record and uh, have had human rights abuses and then people that we, you know, we either didn't oppose in the, 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 the parliament also had some serious challenges and we were okay with that. And, we, and then we just hoped that things would get better. Um, that's probably an over-exaggeration, but but the, I think there's some truth to that. Um, there's been, Seagar has talked a lot about military aid or uh, aid dependency, right? And they've basically come up with some figures like from 15 to 45 percent of uh, the, if, if the, the aid that we're providing is from 15 to 45 percent of their national budget, budget, then there's a high level of, of potential for corruption. And, and for countries, that have weak institution, weak institutions. That number is like around fifteen percent, um, and there's lots of examples of. I mean, I think of how that aid dependency has subverted things. Great. Um, I mean, yeah, you're essentially saying we're the helicopter parents of uh, security assistance, um, mm -hmm. which I think in some in the Iraq and Afghanistan context, I think that's a pretty fair um, way to describe mm -hmm. at least certain cycles. Um, of our efforts there. Um, in other places, I think it's a lot more complicated. And we're certainly not helicoptering because it's a much more modest effort. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, I worked on Africa, so I'm thinking about most of the continent of Africa. Um, you know, Tunisia's um, sort of an exception in some ways, but not in every way. Um, and so the idea that sort of we need to let our counterparts take the lead. There is a sense there that the demand signal is going to have almost perfect overlap with what we would like to provide mm -hmm. to them. And so I think you've gotten at the crux of the problem, which is we often want to incentivize in these partners to do something that they probably wouldn't do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's diametrically opposed to what they would want to be doing. Um, and sometimes it's just like not a priority, mm -hmm. right? So I think about like the Ugandans and the CLRA mission, which I think continued past when they would have been comfortable taking some risk there and we didn't want to take that risk. Um, you know, well, okay, we'll keep doing this, right? Because we got a lot of other stuff going on with you and, and you know, we want to continue to be um, productive in this relationship. Um, so I think it really depends on the context and on the partnership itself. Um, but I do agree that if you are a third party you single-handedly trying to rebuild the society that still has outstanding social cleavage problems, you can't do it. You're an outsider. You're eventually going to leave someday, and everyone knows. And if you have an, an enemy like the Taliban who is exceptionally patient, you know they're going to wait you out. Um, and so that, that requires an a approach that's going to use the organic matter that's there, I think, more than we initially did. Great. Stephen, did you want to? Follow? I mean, yeah, I, I would just, I would just reinforce the idea that I, I think Afghanistan and Iraq are, are in many ways, um, exceptions. you know, exceptions to the rule. Uh, I, I actually, when I was looking at a universe of cases, right, for people said, oh, you have to include Afghanistan and Iraq; they're counterterrorism partners. And I was like, you know, yes, and <laughs> not generalizable. <laughs> not generalizable. We right, we've had over a hundred thousand troops in both countries at some point. That skews the relationship in most places. This is much more of a traditional partnership um, where we don't have sort of that level of on the ground influence. And as somebody who, you know, one of the things I, I was tasked with when I was at DOD was to lead a review that looked at how are we going to wield influence in, in, in South Asia and Central Asia once US troops have left Afghanistan. That review is now a useful paperweight or thought exercise, <laughs> um, right? Uh, you know, I, I just, I think those are, those are, those are different. Um, but yeah, I, do I agree that I think we're, we're uh, 
not only are we helicopter parents, but we're often failure. I think across the board, everybody's failure adverse, right? Nobody, nobody ever wants to work. No, nobody's ever worked on a project that was a failure, right? These have all always going to get written as successes, or we're going to try to sort of position them in the near term as successes. We don't want to see these things fail. There's not a culture where it's okay to fail. Right. Great. Next question from the audience. Sir, right there. Wait, you got two more. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. I look forward to reading the book. Um, so if Afghanistan and Iraq are the outliers, Somalia is kind of the perfect example of many of the complexities that you all have brought up. Moral hazard from reduced political engagement, regional partners in Amazon mm -hmm. in uh, transition, yeah. varying degrees of will and capability, and then greater influence of external actors, Gulf states, mm -hmm. Turkey, and that's in Somalia and in the Greater Horn. Can you take one or two of the examples of the greatest hits of CT lesson learned and apply them <laughs> on what you would change in Somalia right now? Thank you. Um, well, I would, I would go back to, I mean, you're going to be more of a Somalia hand than I am. Okay. But um, I would go back to soon after 9-11. I would say one of the first right, lessons learned uh, in tr was, you know, was that idea of mapping the human terrain and being careful about working with non-state actors. Right? We didn't really have a partner government there. So instead, we worked with local warlords. Um, you know, and had a very, very small number of U.S. forces on the ground. Um, and those warlords not only handed over the very small number or sought to hand over this very small number of al-Qaeda that were in East Africa, but also Islamists um, that were not necessarily affiliated with AQ and other people they didn't like, right? And, and that uh, opens the door for al-Shabaab to form. And then we view the Ethiopian, you know, invasion as, you know, sort of this you know, that, that is a way for the United States to potentially be, you know, uh, you know, working through somebody on the ground, except the Ethiopian invasion opens the door for, Somal for, for Shabab to grow, um, you know, as a, you know, Somali nationalist force, which it, it was not, right, at the outset, but it positions itself as such. Um, and so I think this is just, if you look at the greatest hits of the ways in which you can kind of misjudge your partners, um, and the outcomes that you're going to have from partnering with them. Uh, there, are, there are some really good lessons learned there um, from Somalia. I think today, um, Somalia potentially will hold lessons for us in terms of the complexity of partnered operations uh, with forces on the ground, um, in terms of uh, civilian casualties, in terms of what exposes our forces to, in terms of questions about what it means to be engaged in a train advise and a company Right, mission, Somalia is not a war zone, and yet people, right, US forces are in harm's way there. So I think now there are sort of lessons about those gray zone air, I don't, not using gray zone conflict, but those gray areas mm -hmm. of cooperation where we're not just sort of providing arm's length support, and we're not just providing air support, and we're not just relying on you, but, uh, you know, sometimes we're working hand in glove um, in very, very complex environments. Yeah, Somalia is a, I mean, it's, it's its own case for a variety of reasons, much like Iraq and Afghanistan are, but Somalia is interesting in this context because when the Islamic Courts Union had taken over, prompting Ethiopia to invade in 2006, that was sort of the outcome of domestic politics in Somalia allowed to run their course pretty much unmolested by the outside world. I mean, not completely, but that was, that was the outcome that Somalia came up with for itself. And that was not good for yeah. regional actors or, or for us, in, in our opinion. Um, it is unclear now if we were to allow the political process to play out and Amazon, because there's been talk about Amazon um, drawing down dramatically or leaving entirely. Um, you know, what, what would Somalia then look like? You know, would Somaliland's independence take hold? Would Puntland follow? Then would sort of a rump Somalia be left over? And who would? You know, would the government now be able to consolidate legitimacy or not? Um, those, are, I think, are all open questions. And I think the international community's continued um, hope that AMSOM uh, will extend its mission is essentially to not answer that question <laughs> yet um, and to try and, and eliminate or repress al Shabaab to the point that when sort of the international community backs off a little bit, the political actors that are left are not al-Shabaab, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so 
you know, that's just a proposition that eventually is going to be tested about whether or not al-Shabaab really has that staying power. Um, or whether something like the Islamic Courts Union comes back, because al-Shabaab was the radical fringe mm -hmm. of the Islamic Courts Union, right? Um, so, uh, and I think, you know, Stephen hinted at we are involved in Somalia through state actors. Like we mm -hmm. are comfortable working yep. through state actors yep. and through the African Union. Um, and working with non-state actors is a mm -hmm. lot harder um, in the Somali context because it, it, the social fabric is so complicated. Um, you know, you'll hear many a person in the national security space be like, oh my god, the clan structure. And it's like, that's not even the half of it. Yeah. Um, but I think that's probably true everywhere in the world. And we just really respect it in Somalia <laughs> because it's been so difficult. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it really highlights the, the need for, for greater oversight and authorities that are, you know, built into our processes and legislation for working with yeah. non-state actors. Yeah. We, we do these partnerships on an ad hoc basis um, and, and have to relearn some lessons as we go. I saw some hands in the back, if those are still, that's the young woman over here on the left. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, my name's Sam Stern. I'm an intern at Brookings. Sure, sorry. Um, and I was just wondering, you talked about the need to avoid over-reliance on security assistance and uh, military partnerships. So as we, seen as we see terrorists begin to exploit social media, uh, the internet, encrypted communications, what opportunities um, does this present for uh, potential states to then use the cyber domain um, to improve partnerships in counterterrorism. Thank you. Um, so I read a report recently that was fascinating that um, compared radicalization online in sub-Saharan Africa to other parts of the world and found that it was much less prevalent in Africa, that sort of personal and family connections were sort of the, the driving <coughs> factor um, in the near term. And in the longer term, it was also government action. So um, folks will be sort of, there will be roiling discontent. And then if the government takes exactly the wrong action at exactly the right time, um, that's, that's sort of how it works in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, that said, the cyber piece of terrorist operations, particularly on the Horn, is sort of increasingly interesting. Um, and the cutting edge out there is being able to figure out how they, they've, you know, most terrorists have moved from web-based platforms to apps, um, and they app hop, and, you know, tracking that is really hard. Um, so you're asking, I think, like the question that analysts really need to be asking in the near term. Um, again, particularly as we're seeing sort of the global jihadist campaign, if I may use that term, really change its shape and change the way it, it operates. Figuring out how the internet is a means to that end, I think, is critically important. Mm -hmm. Either one of you want to? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I just wanted to add that. Um, I, I totally agree, but I, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. Um, I think there is still a concern about technology that we provide that allows security forces to identify and target um, because we have seen technology being provided for for political action as well. So, mm -hmm. and that, like the use of uh, identifying things uh, through apps and through, is seems particularly risky. Um, so, yeah. Do, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, when you were asked, I think your question was sort of like, what opportunities is that going to present for for cooperation? I was actually thinking this is going to present potentially opportunities <laughs> for partner nations in certain parts of the world to be able to securitize right elements of. Yeah technology um, in, in terms of their, right, their lead us to, to work with them to be more intrusive in ways that are not necessarily <coughs> beneficial to their societies writ large because of our concerns uh, about terrorism, which is not, by the way, to take away from the very, very valid concerns that I think, right, from a CT practitioner's perspective, mm -hmm. one should have about the use of encrypted technology. Um, that is 100% valid. And, I, you know, I'll go even further, the potential for, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about cyber terrorism. We haven't actually seen that yet, but we may see that uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the potential for, for countries, to, you know, for rather terrorist groups um, to take a page from ISIS's book and build sort of a, glo you know, a global virtual community. I, I think all of that is very valid, but in terms of the opportunities there, I think 
what I worry about is, is some of the actors that are going to benefit most from, from the, the space for cooperation there are going to be uh, authoritarian regimes with whom we're going to feel compelled to, operate, to cooperate in the space. And that's a really tough conversation for yeah. companies to have as yes. well, right? So it's yes. not just USG to, no. to government partners, it's USG to social media platforms right. to other governments. Right. I've right. Been, uh, yeah, I it mean, makes things way complicated. Mm -hmm. go, to, go talk to Facebook about where you want them to sort of share information or not share information or cut down on, community, you know, and that opens up a whole different, mm -hmm. that's a whole different level of conversation there for them. Um, so, yeah. Great. We have a couple of questions here in the front that I'm going to go ahead and bundle. Um, just pause for the microphone for a moment, please. And we'll start with this gentleman and then pass it to your left, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is Jahan, a student of political science from Afghanistan. So uh, as you mentioned in, in your discussion that the US counterterrorism efforts increased since the 9-11 attacks, and considering Pakistan's role in the region, uh, does you still count on Pakistan as a counterterrorism partner? And the other part of my question is that how would you define the U.S. counterterrorism efforts, considering the fact that these different actors are involved, like Saudi Arabia? And also, it seems difficult to win the war with the military option. Great. Thank you, so. Great. Next question, please. Thank you. Yeah, Eric Hirshhorn. I'm retired both from the federal government and private law practice. Uh, I get a profound sense of pessimism about the counterterrorism effort from this panel. And I'm curious as to whether you could point to any CT successes where the United States has made a difference. Great. Um, well, it wouldn't be a, a panel on counterterrorism if we didn't talk about Pakistan, right? Um, so I, I, I wasn't, I'm not sure I grasped the second part of your, your question, although I agree that, that you know, the military option is not a solution in and of itself. Um, yeah, the United States still gets some counterterrorism cooperation from Pakistan, although not nearly the degree to which it would like. Um, it still gets access through Pakistan into Afghanistan, which if you submit that the United States is in Afghanistan for counterterrorism purposes, then access through Pakistan is a form of counterterrorism cooperation. I would argue it is in many ways, the cooperation that, the United, that keeps the United States from putting pressure on Pakistan in a lot of other areas, right, is that the United States doesn't, you know, has never been as coercive as it would have been with Pakistan had it not been for fear of losing uh, access, not on, only on the ground, but especially uh, in the air, overflight into and out of Afghanistan. Uh, it also continues to get cooperation in the form of access to airspace for drone strikes when it launches them. Most of the drone strikes that have been launched in Pakistan have been launched with Pakistan's at least tacit permission. And I think it's, I don't know, but it is probably safe to assume that there is still a baseline level of intelligence cooperation, right? A very baseline in terms of uh, sharing information, you know, about imminent attacks and perhaps acting on them, uh, you know, to thwart them because it's in Pakistan's interest to not have an attack over here. Um, which I guess goes to, sir, your question about counterterrorism successes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say that there hasn't been a attack from abroad waged against the United States since 9-11 and that that is a success, right? It depends how you want to quantify and qualify success. If your bar is no external group has attacked the United States since 9-11, then USCT policy is a smashing success, right? If it is fewer terrorists today than there were previously and le you know, less instability in the world, uh, you know, what have you, then you've got a lot more failures. I would also point to uh, the efforts against Al-Qaeda Central in Pakistan as another not, uh, you know, not absolute success, but you know, this is an area where the U.S. and the Pakistanis may have shared a threat from AQ, but the Pakistanis were not prepared to do a whole lot about it after about 2003, 2004. Certainly by 2005, their efforts were declining. Through U.S. drone strikes uh, and support for Pakistani counterterrorism operations on the ground that targeted al-Qaeda's allies, um, AQ, core AQ in the region has been seriously degraded, not defeated, but seriously degraded. Um, there are a lot of other failures that one would point to globally and specifically with Pakistan in terms of what the United States has been able to accomplish vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban, the Haqqani network, Lashkar Taiba, what have you. Um, so none of these are, that's not an unqualified success by any stretch. But, you know, I, I, I guess I would come back to 
the title of the book was How Partners Help and Hinder. Most of these partners help and hinder. So you have some successes, you have failures as well. Yeah, I would say there's, there's plenty to point to in the, the tactical and operational sense yeah. um, in terms of success against particular terrorist individuals and mm -hmm. terrorist groups. We certainly eliminated plenty of terrorist yeah. groups and, and terrorist individuals. Um, but again, back to sort of the point that there's a larger political question going on. Again, terrorism, this is a cliche, but terrorism is a tactic, and it is a tactic that is used by political mm -hmm. actors to try and have a political effect, right? I mean, part of the definition of terrorism is that it's getting the attention of a broader audience. It's not that immediate kinetic um, gain that they're, they're getting. They're trying to scare people, and they're trying to scare people into um, ceasing their support for a government, usually, or their support for a, a foreign government's collaboration with their government, or what have you. Um, and in that sense, terrorism will always be a problem. It has been a major problem um, from the US perspective and from the international community's perspective since at least the 1970s. Um, I just finished this great book called The First War on Terrorism, which was about the Reagan administration's mm. efforts to grapple with this. So you know, we're, we're never going to eliminate terrorism as an option, right? But what we are going to do is be able to confront each political issue mm -hmm. in which terrorism mm -hmm. comes up um, and do that more effectively. And so I think that part of the point here is that security assistance, again, is but one narrow way to get at that much broader issue. And so you need to think of security and assistance in terms of a larger strategic approach. And you need to think of it in terms not of the entire globe, but you know, country by country, even you know, community by community where these political problems are erupting into violence. Um, violence of all kinds, but in particular we're concerned about terrorist, terrorism that crosses international borders. Um, and so the pessimism you might hear is also sort of my sense that this is going to continue to be a problem. It's been a problem for decades. Mm -hmm. It will continue to be a problem until we start getting at the under, underlying issues here. Great, thanks. Colby, do you want to show? I mean, I, I totally agree with just what, what Alice said. <laughs> I mean, maybe just to elaborate a little bit, I mean, I think we've had some tactical successes against Boko Haram, against LRA, you know, in Africa. Um, but, you know, uh, as we've seen with, with, with in situations in Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan and other countries, if we're not addressing some of these deeper political issues or sort of root causes, it's just, it's just going to come back up, you know. I mean, Mali, Mali actually didn't really go away. We, we, yeah. I mean, we had some, some tactical success. So um, I think in, in Somalia, like, if there's been some recent research out by Paul Williams, it, that um, is a professor at uh, George Washington University, um, which is basically arguing that you know without Amazon we'd be in a lot worse situation, mm -hmm. and and I think I think he's he's probably right there. But you know I think you've outlined the serious challenges that that we have. One of the lessons learned is is uh, conditioning. Um, I mean these guys have done much more work on this than me, but it 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 ha they have been su some successes in Afghanistan, and. In Somalia, they just, as you probably know, they just cut like a bunch of food, food aid, and other types of aid to the the SNA, not the Danab, not the special battalion that the U.S. is supporting. Um, and I understand that's probably like it's happened a number of times, and I'm not so sure how successful it's it's going to be, but it it does seem that it, it, it you know it can work. Um, and the other thing that I, uh, the the that I think is super important, which uh, Mara Carlin um, has highlighted in one of the panels, is like leadership matters. Like leadership is a big deal, and we don't, it doesn't seem pay that much attention to the individuals that, that we're working with and, and who, who's in charge. And, and trying to get the right people uh, or support the right people make, can make a big difference. Um, so. Great. Yeah. Well, it's it's clear that uh, the reliance on on local security partners is not going away anytime soon, given the trends we see in the security environment, the political and budgetary pressures certainly that we're experiencing ho at home, as well as uh, those experienced by by our allies uh, abroad. So it's an exciting time to be digging into these issues, and I'm so grateful to have had three of the top uh, thinkers and experts on this issue uh, joining us today. To, uh, to unpack uh, some elements of, of this critical issue. And thank you to you all for, for joining us today.